please contact Christian Answers for free information on numerous subjects, important subjects such as the biblical doctrine of the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Free newsletters are available on the heretical position held by many unbiblical cults, such as Jehovah's Witnesses and the Oneness Pentecostals who deny the Trinity. Free newsletters are available on strange groups, such as the King James Onlyites. To receive your free information, please call 512-218-8022 or email us at cdebater at aol.com. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Please check out our YouTube channel page, C Answers TV. That's C A N S W E R S T V. Just type it into the YouTube search box, then click on one of our links for it. Our channel page features 19 playlists on all types of subjects, such as Jehovah's Witnesses with 17 videos. And by the way, these are videos we've produced ourselves. Mormonism, 14 videos. Seventh-day Adventism, 11 videos. Phony TV Preachers and King James Onlyites, 14 videos. Nation of Islam, Black Muslims, this is of the Louis Farrakhan type, 20 videos. God-hating atheists, agnostics, and know-it-alls, 18 videos. Darwin's metaphysical evolution religion, 17 videos. UFOs, ghosts, magic, spiritual warfare, 16 videos. Islam, such as Sunni Muslims, Shiite Muslims, Alawite, Sufis, 54 videos. Roman Catholicism, idolatry, and the Virgin Mary, 71 videos. Anti-Trinitarians, such as the United Pentecostal Church and Church History, 36 videos. Antichrist cults, the New Age and World Religions, 38 videos. Saved by Works, Baptism, Church of Christ, Campbellism, 69 videos. Hell, Lake of Fire, Unpopular Bible Doctrines, 19 videos. Predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism, 54 videos. End Times, Supernatural Prophecies, and Tough Bible Questions, 20 videos, and others. Our videos are free to the viewing public. If you'd like to be immediately notified of our latest uploaded videos, then please subscribe to our C Answers TV YouTube channel. If you have an existing YouTube account, then simply click on the subscribe button at the top of our channel page next to our ministry name, Christian Answers of Austin, Texas. If you don't have a YouTube account, then it is easy to set one up at no cost. Just search YouTube, then the YouTube opening page will appear, and to the left-hand side will be a blue button saying create account. Click on that and follow the instructions. Hello and welcome to Dayspring Evangelism Presents. I'm Jackson Boyette, pastor of Dayspring Fellowship, a Reformed and Baptist church in the city of Austin, Texas, and we invite you to join us for the next hour as we talk about an important issue related to uh, the most fundamental uh, issue in all of Christianity, and that is the Bible as the Word of God. Obviously, if you're going to uh, begin with a foundation for understanding the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the plan of salvation, uh, the nature of God and His role as judge of the earth and your role as a creature in His world, and if you're a Christian, a son or daughter of God, you go to a source book, and that book is the Word of God, the Holy Bible. 
Now, this special program, which will be the first of two programs, is uh, concerned with which Bible do we use. And it specifically revolves around a translation that has been the most beloved and best-selling translation of the Bible for more than 350 years. The King James Version of 1611 is a version of the Bible that uh, most people grew up on. I dare say that if you're listening to this program today and you're not a particularly religious person, that if you have one Bible in your home, it will be a King James Version Bible. This Bible has been used by so many people for so many years that it has been only natural that people should cling to it because of the associations of the past. And when newer translations come out, they should compare them with the King James Version of the Bible. Now, what's happened in the past 40 years or so is that there's been a number of modern English translations that have uh, been presented. And not only do uh, the flavor and the wording and the tone of these translations differ from the majesty and the grandeur of the King James Version, but there's also some differences in content. In many modern English translations, verses, uh, phrases uh, th that have been used in the King James Version disappear. They're not there in the newer ones. The reason for that is that the newer translations, beginning with the Revised Standard Version of 1952 and going up through uh, the popular present-day versions, such as the New American Standard Version and the New International Version, are based on different Greek texts than the King James Version was based on. This has uh, caused people to ask well, which texts are the most accurate? Which translations are the most accurate? Can we trust the modern translations? Or uh, those who use modern translations have grown to ask, well, can we trust the King James Version? There is a group of hardcore defenders of the King James Version that basically, however, do not consider the question of texts the texts uh, that underlie a translation of the Bible are really what we should be thinking about and talking about, but the particular group of people that we're going to talk about on these two programs have taken the King James Version of the Bible and said, essentially, yes, it translates a certain text, but the fact that it's that text is not as important as Th th that it is a divinely inspired, inerrant translation. And they believe that the translation itself of the King James Version, which was done in 1611, is God's last word to men with regard to uh, preserving the Bible. That the King James Version is inerrant. They even believe that Greek texts that differ from it should be corrected uh, by this particular English translation. And so today, we're going to talk about a cluster of issues regarding Bible translations and texts. Hopefully, this will be of help to those of you who have uh, been wandering through the thicket of Bible translations, wondering which ones you should use. But also, we're going to direct our program to a particular group of people, those who have come under the influence of what we call King James only teaching. The primary exponent of this King James only teaching in America is a Baptist minister named Peter Ruckman. And the followers of Peter Ruckman uh, have been called Ruckmanites. And we hope that if you have received Peter Ruckman's literature in the mail, uh, his Bible Believers Bulletin, or if you know someone who is very uh, rabidly a King James only person, or if you hold to that view yourself, or if you are a Ruckmanite, that you will pay careful attention to this program and the program following, because we want to talk about this very vital issue. What's at stake here, we think, is actually uh, the formation of something cultish called bibliolatry, worshiping a particular translation of the Bible, making the 
uh, adherence to that translation of the Bible a test of fellowship so that those who do not hold to the King James only position are somehow less than good Christians and less than responsible preachers. So we want to talk about this issue today with two men who have done a great deal uh, both in terms of research and speaking out about this, ver about this issue, and it's a real pleasure to have them uh, on Dayspring Evangelism Presents. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, an old friend who has been on Dayspring Evangelism Presents before, Mr. Bob L. Ross. Bob L. Ross is uh, an author and a uh, publisher. He is the director of Pilgrim Publications in Pasadena, a publishing company that was formed in order to reprint the entire uh, series of sermons by the great Baptist preacher Charles H. Spurgeon. Bob Ross is also uh, an expert on dealing with cults. Specifically, uh, he has debated Church of Christ ministers and written uh, several books against the Church of Christ movement, most notably the Restoration Movement and Campbellism, its history and heresies. And Bob, it's good to have you back on this program. I'm glad to be back. And our other guest is <clears throat> Gary Hudson. Gary Hudson is a student at Luther Rice Seminary in Jacksonville, Florida, is working on his Master of Divinity there, and he has begun to publish a new uh, newsletter called Baptist Biblical Heritage, a newsletter that stands for historic Baptist views of the Bible with emphasis on this King James Version controversy. And one of the most relevant things about Gary Hudson for purposes of this program is that he was a Ruckmanite. Gary, it's good to have you on this program. Thank you. It's good to be here. Gary is from Florida, and uh, we welcome you to Texas, Gary, and we want to get right into the subject here. Now, I have um, given an introduction uh, about what is meant by King James only, but if I've left anything out, why don't you uh, fine-tune it? Well, when we speak of the King James Version controversy, or we use the expression King James only, First of all, we need to note what it is not referring to. Okay, good. We are not referring to everyone who has made the King James Bible the only translation or version from which they do all of their study, uh, preaching, uh, memorization, etc. We are not referring necessarily to everyone who believes that the King James Bible is the very best translation in English and remains unsurpassed. King James only refers to a particular idea about the King James Bible which says that uh, it is the Word of God, and I want to underscore that, capital T-H-E, the Word of God to the exclusion of all other translations being considered the Word of God. And the arguments in favor of this view are voiced in several publications that I have here with me today, any one of which could be very typical of what we're speaking of. Here's a little booklet, for example, by uh, Bruce Lackey, and it's called Why I Believe the Old King James Bible. And he articulates this position very clearly here on page one. He says, quote, the only way a person can be born again is by the incorruptible Word of God. Was I born again on that night long ago? Have I been deluded all these years? Did a book full of errors change my life and make me love God, whom I have so long ignored? Now, what he means is, did a translation with any translation mistakes in it cause me to be born again? Then he says this, if the King James Version has errors, it cannot be the Word of God and I could not have been born again. How many millions of people would have thus been deceived? And we have some other statements relative to those who would say that the translation in order to be called the Word of God must be an absolutely perfect translation in every detail. Uh, this little publication came out in April of 1980. This is called the King James uh, Contender, and they have a King James Bible College. This is out of North Carolina, and a King James Preacher's Fellowship, believe it or not. 
But uh, they say this on the front of this publication, the King James Bible AV 1611 is the only authoritative source of inspired scriptures in the English language. All modern day Bible versions contain a mixture of error and truth, thereby becoming invalid as a source of inspired scripture. The King James Bible is the inerrant word of God providentially preserved and transmitted to the people of our time. Unique in its unerring portrayal of the exact rendering of the original text, the King James Bible reigns supreme, having no rival among all English translations of the world. There is no need to revise, update, correct, better explain, or change in any way the present English King James Bible. Now, what they're saying is, is that in order for a translation to be called the Word of God, it must be an absolutely perfect translation. But what we have here is a confusion of general terms with technical terms. These people have forgotten why a translation is called the Word of God. The King James translators themselves said in their preface to the King James Version, and by the way, many King James only advocates have never read the translator to the reader that the King James men wrote themselves in 1611, what they said about translation. And here is what they said about calling a translation the Word of God. Did the King James translators believe that a translation had to be perfect in order to be called the Word of God? Well, they said this. Now to the latter we answer, that we do, do not deny, nay, we affirm and avow that the very meanest translation of the Bible in English set forth by men of our profession containeth the Word of God, nay, is the Word of God. And then they went on to say, No cause, therefore, why the word translated should be denied to be the word or forbidden to be current, notwithstanding some imperfections and blemishes may be noted in the setting forth of it. They use the illustration here also of how that when King James would go off into a foreign country, be it France or Germany or Italy or wherever, and his speech would be translated into that language, it would still be the king's speech, even though there may have been different ways of rendering what he said, and even though the translator of his speech would not perfectly give in that language in every word what the king was saying. It was still the king's speech, you see. So what we have here is a confusion with the Ruckmanite people or the King James only people of technical terms with general terms. We can refer to any translation of the Bible that is accurate as the Word of God because it is a translation of the original Hebrew text and Greek text that the Bible was originally written in. That's why it's the Word of God. They've forgotten the reasons why a translation is called the Word of God. Technically, however, it is not the Word of God. Technically, it is a translation of the Word of God. It is the Word of God in the sense you could call any translation the Word of God, but technically, it's a translation of the Word of God. What they want to do is take the technical idea and say if it has a mistake anywhere in translation, that therefore it is not the Word of God anymore. So there is a confusion, you see, with technical terms and general terms on the part of this group. And I believe that it's not only based on, on ignorance, but it's based on this uh, play of words. And uh, there's a brief history behind this as well that's very important to note. And that is the fact that, uh, as uh, our brother here mentioned, there was a, co a controversy that started in this century over the which Greek text to translate from. Well, the King James tra the King James uh, only controversy began in the early 1970s actually as a controversy over which Greek text to translate the New Testament into. It was primarily a New Testament controversy whether we're going to use the Texas Receptus that the King James was based upon or whether we're going to use the Alexandrian text that the New American Standard Bible is based upon. So the controversy was over which Greek text to use. But interestingly enough, it developed into a controversy over defending the King James Bible as an infallible translation of that Texas Receptus. 
So what begun as a Textus Receptus argument over which Greek text to translate from evolved by the time you get to 1979-1980 into a controversy over defending the King James Version as itself inspired, inerrant, infallible, preserved in the English. Now what I am primarily interested in is studying how this shift occurred, why it occurred, and sometimes, therefore, it becomes necessary for us to look at those who have been the leading proponents of the Texas Receptus argument in order to find background to that thinking. Gary, uh, at this point, uh, at least in my own reaction to what you're saying here, I think it would be well for you to speak to the uh, issue of the contribution of Mr. Hills, who wrote on this subject. Well, Edward F. Hills uh, wrote a very popular and landmark book in 1956. He had it published by the name of the uh, King James Version Defended. And Dr. Hill's just to uh, let up Gary to the contra contribution to this um, this idea was to actually give scholarly respectability to the Texas Receptus only argument. Let's talk for just a minute about that terminology because we may be going off into deeper waters than our audience uh, can swim in right now. Uh, tell us about uh, the Textus Receptus, which is the Greek text that the King James New Testament was translated from. Well, actually, the name Textus Receptus was not ascribed to that form of Greek text until 1633 by the LZ reversion. But, uh, the Greek New Testament was first compiled and published by Erasmus, Desiderius Erasmus, in 1516. Erasmus used five uh, late Greek manuscripts. He was not trying to be a textual critic. He was trying to be the first to produce the first published edition of the Greek New Testament. Right. For one thing, it was recognized that the common man would have a tool in his hands wherewith to critique the official Latin Vulgate Bible of the Roman Catholic Church if that Greek New Testament came out mm -hmm. because everyone knew that the Bible was originally written in Greek. So in 1516 he took these five Greek manuscripts which dated from the 11th <coughs> to the 14th or 15th centuries and he put together this Greek text. He went through three editions of that text. By the way, the first two editions did not contain 1 John 5, 7, a very disputed passage. And Martin Luther, therefore, when he used Erasmus' text for his translation, used an early edition so that Martin Luther's Bible did not contain 1 John 5, 7. But anyway, subsequent ed editions of the Textus Receptus came from Erasmus' work. We had those of Beza. We had before Erasmus, actually, the Complutensian. And then we had the editions of, of uh, Stevens. And then the King James translators, when they sat down to translate, used six different editions of the Textus Receptus. They did not just use one edition, they used several. Now, Hills recognizes this in his book. He recognizes that there's a problem with, with his theory of saying that the Textus Receptus is an absolutely infallible reproduction of every detail of the original autographs. So what he argues for is that the translators were providentially led in every place and every choice of readings they made among these Greek texts to use the autograph text. So he's made the King James translators the official guides to textual criticisms, a highly subjective approach to this whole thing. So Hills began the circular reasoning process which takes the King James Bible, makes it a guide to textual criticism, and recapitulates to the autographs from the translation. And he simply asserted this to be the case. He really offered no real proof for what he was saying. Let me give you just, before we go on here, uh, an example of the Hill's uh, reasoning uh, process in relation to this. On while, page. You're, while you're turning there, uh, sure. let me just make a comment about what Hills is doing. Mm -hmm. Hills, um, as I understand him, is assuming mm -hmm. that God's Word must be providentially preserved at all times without error. 
So uh, in order to uh, argue for the providential preservation of the text, which by the way is uh, one of the statements in the Westminster um, uh, Confession of Faith, that, uh, which Hills would subscribe to, that the text has been providentially preserved, he has to say that the King James Version uh, translators were led without error to the right readings in their choice of the six editions of the Textus Receptus. Yes, he, he would use the term preservation as well, but actually it's a false preservation argument because what Hills believed was not that the King James translators preserved the Word of God. What he was actually teaching was that they restored the Word of God because there was no Greek text, one Greek text edition that they used. They used a variety of the Textus Receptus. Yes. So his argument was they were providentially led in every place, even in the 60 or so places where the King James translators departed altogether from any Greek text and went by the Latin Vulgate alone and amended the Texas Receptus. He says here on page 200, in the Texas Receptus, God corrected the few mistakes of any consequence which yet remained in the traditional New Testament text of the majority of Greek manuscripts. The following are some of the most familiar and important uh, of those relatively few Latin Vulgate readings, which though not part of the traditional Greek text, he admits it's, these are not part of the majority of manuscripts, seem to have been placed in the Texas Receptus by the direction of God's special providence and therefore are to be retained. Now he, he simply asserts this to be the case and then he looks hither and yon through the entire history of textual transmission, quotations from the church fathers, etc., etc., in every place he can find a Texas Receptus reading cited by a church father or in a version or in a manuscript, it is correct. But every place where that reading is omitted, it is wrong. Let's so take a, it's a subjective approach. Let's see, take a concrete issue. example of what you're talking about. You mentioned 1 John 5, 7 and 8a. And let me just read that. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth. Now, those, those words um, are in the uh, King James Version of the Bible. They are familiar to us all, and when we find them missing in a modern translation of the Bible, uh, our tendency is to think, well, there's a conspiracy here to cut out one of the clearest verses in the Bible arguing for the existence of the Trinity. And we think that there's been some sort of demonic plot afoot in order to remove something from our precious Bibles that uh, uh, teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. In actual fact, uh, something else was going on entirely with the inclusion of 1 John 5, 7. Why don't you tell us about that? And that'll put uh, this kind of uh, thing in a more concrete uh, illustration, I think. Well, when Erasmus compiled the Texas Receptus in 1516 and had it published, his first edition did not contain 1 John 5, 7, simply because there were no Greek manuscripts that Erasmus had at that time that had that verse and there was quite a, an outcry from the established church at that time sure. to put it back in because that verse was in the Latin Vulgate Bible but in Erasmus six, uh, second edition of the Greek text he still did not have that verse because it was not in the Greek copies. Well in just before his third edition was produced he said with a, a rash promise that he made that if anyone could produce a Greek manuscript in any of the libraries of Europe that had that verse in there, he would therefore put it in the Bible. Well, one was not just uh, uh, produced, one was, uh, as Bruce Metzger points out, made to order, actually. And the scribes went back, the Roman Catholic scribes, and translated that verse from the Latin Vulgate back into Greek in manuscript 61 and that manuscript today is in Dublin, Ireland. You can go over there and examine it. The only other manuscripts that have been discovered that have the verse are an 11th century manuscript, uh, manuscript 635. And this verse, however, in this manuscript 
is in the margin, not in the text. It's in the margin. That is a marginal uh, interpretation. And the marginal note comes from the 17th century, it says, not the 11th century. Uh, manuscript 88 of the 12th century, again, it's in the margin. And manuscript 629 of the 14th century, which is in the Vatican at Rome. A lot of times people say that the Vaticanus manuscript or manuscript B is a Roman Catholic manuscript because it's in the Vatican at Rome. Well, manuscript 604, manuscript 629, and many other Byzantine and majority text manuscripts are also in the Vatican. That does not make them Roman Catholic manuscripts, you see. But this verse had a Roman Catholic tradition behind it, and it wasn't even in Jerome's original Latin Vulgate. It came in during the Middle Ages as a marginal gloss interpretation of that other triad there, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and it fit kind of nicely as an interpretation to add in that the uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit bear witness in heaven. And then it came translated back into the Greek from Erasmus' editions of the Greek text, and now it wound up in the King James Version. So it's not surprising when uh, uh, scholarly consensus uh, says today that this verse should not be a part of our Bible because it was not in the original text. Now some people say, well, uh, haven't you removed the Trinity doctrine? Well, the Trinity is taught clearly in many other places, but do you want to add to the scripture? You see, people have the idea of comparing the readings with the King James and that it's wrong because it differs with the King James. Mm -hmm. But let's don't compare it with the King James to see if it's wrong. Let's compare it with the best of the manuscript evidence. And the manuscript evidence is universal. That verse was not a part of the original text of Scripture. Let me take off just a minute and ask Bob Ross a question. Bob, you use the King James Version. Yeah. Uh, you use the King James Version uh, to uh, make your cases and points in your recent book on Daniel. Um, what uh, uh, as, a, as one who prefers the King James and preaches out of it, studies out of it, and uses it for uh, reference, how do you see yourself differing from this King James only position? Well, in my experience, um, my experience in studying the Bible kind of predates my acquaintance with the King James only position. Going back into the early 50s when I first started studying the Bible, I went out and uh, I had a King James Bible and I bought other translations as well. I laid them down in front of me on a big wide board and I would go through these Bibles and compare and in conjunction with that I would have uh, concordances, uh, word dictionaries like Vine's Dictionary and Strong's Concordance and various books like this and it never crossed my mind to think that any one of these translations was verbally inspired or inerrant. I didn't think of that at all. I realized uh, somewhere I picked up the knowledge of the fact that the original language was the Hebrew and the Greek and of course some of the Aramaic and the Old Testament I think in Daniel. In Daniel, yeah. And uh, I was simply searching for what is the most accurate translation into the language that I understand. Mm -hmm. And as I studied my King James Bible, I would come across words that had become archaic. Uh, I, one illustration I always use is the word prevent. For proceed. Right. It yeah. means to proceed rather than to hinder the way we use the word today. If I prevent someone, I hinder them. Mm -hmm. But in the Bible, it meant to go before. And so as I would come upon those kind of words, sometimes my margin would give me a definition that was consistent with modern English. So it never crossed my mind to think, well, this is the one and only translation. Then, of course, in the book business, I have people come in my store weekly or maybe even daily, uh, and they say, well, you should not be selling these other translations. They're not the Word of God. And uh, these people are being motivated by literature that they receive, by spokespersons that they hear, by uh, men whom I regard as being uh, extremely uh, untruthful to both history and to the intellectual pursuit of the study of the scriptures. And uh, these poor people are victims, and I sympathize with them. And I'm so grateful to God for Gary here who's come along, and the Lord just seemingly has 
uh, placed into his lap so much material to expose this thing, one of which is the actual background of it. Gary, why don't you at this time explain where this idea originated with this gentleman who was a Seventh-day Adventist. Okay, we uh, uh, mentioned the fact of Peter Ruckman. And uh, Peter Ruckman uh, developed the idea that the King James Version was given by inspiration of God or contained advanced revelation over the Greek and Hebrew, et cetera, et cetera. Where did the argument come from that or where did he get his ideas? Where was he influenced at? At what point in the controversy? Going back over this again, what I said earlier, it started as a Textus Receptus argument, okay, over which Greek text to translate from, developed into an argument over defending the King James as an infallible translation of the Textus Receptus. Now, Peter Ruckman, in his book... Let me, let me clarify one thing okay. before you go on. Sure. Um, those who take this King James only position mm -hmm. do not like the New King James Version. Correct. And the New King James Version is also a translation of mm -hmm. the Textus Receptus. Right. So I make that point to clarify to our audience that it is not a question of the text. It is a mm -hmm. question of the right translation of mm -hmm. the text. And we have two translations of the Textus Receptus, mm -hmm. the Old and the New King Jameses, and these King James only people do not like the New King James. Mm -hmm. It's the old translation that they like. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's the idea of which translation is the Word of God. Yes. Which Bible, in fact, David Otis Fuller's book is titled, and this came out in 1970, the same year Peter Ruckman's book, Manuscript Evidence, came out. Hold the front of that. And uh, yeah. which Bible was published by David Otis Fuller in 1970. Who is um, he? David Otis Fuller passed away in 1988. He was a pastor of the Wealthy Street Baptist Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan for many years. And uh, he was not really an author. He was a com uh, compiler of articles here in defense of the Texas Receptus. Now, one man he used from which also he derived the title, which Bible, okay, was a man by the name of Benjamin G. Wilkinson. For nearly half, or about 46 percent, we've estimated, of the content of his book, which Bible. Fuller used an, 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 a, um, a writer by the name of Benjamin G. Wilkinson, and all that Fuller told the trusting reader about this obscure individual was that for many years he taught in a small and obscure eastern college. <laughs> and of course with that uh, introducing someone uh, in that sort of way it leads you to wonder what small and eastern college it is. And in fact he didn't even say it was a religious college. All he said was uh, Benjamin G. Wilkinson, Ph.D., is all but unknown to the world of scholarship. But once his work is carefully considered, it will be evident that here is a scholar of the first rank with a thorough knowledge on the subjects of which he wrote. Dr. Wilkinson taught for many years in a small and obscure eastern college. For this excellent work which he produced, he secured copyrights both in England and America back in 1930. Now he goes on here about Wilkinson, but that's all he told us about this man. Well, we had wondered for uh, some time who, just who this Benjamin G. Wilkinson was. My co-editor, Doug Kudelek, searched for at least 12 or 15 years or so, beginning in the early 70s, trying to find out who Benjamin Wilkinson was. There was never anything avail available on this man from the libraries or from encyclopedias or literature, uh, literature of any kind. Uh, almost was a mythical uh, type character. So, um, I was tipped off at a meeting that I spoke at in uh, Illinois last year that Benjamin G. Wilkinson was a Seventh-day Adventist. So what we decided to do was go directly to the Adventists themselves and we wrote to uh, Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan and obtained a full obituary on Benjamin G. Wilkinson. We found out that Benjamin G. Wilkinson was not just a Seventh-day Adventist but that he was a theologian an influential figure, an evangelist within the Seventh-day Adventist church and had proselyted many people to Seventh-day Adventism, had been a Seventh-day Adventist all his life and a theologian and even a college president. And that small and obscure Eastern college that he uh, 
uh, taught in that Fuller mentioned was Washington Missionary College. In fact, he didn't just teach there. He was Dean of Theology at this Seventh-day Adventist Eastern College, and he was president of the college at one time also. Now, we also got a hold of Wilkinson's original book, Authorized Bible Vindicated. And uh, I have an, a, a copy of the original work right here by uh, Benjamin G. Wilkinson. This was written in, in 1930. Wilkinson passed away in 1968, just two years before this book came out. Now, we found that Fuller uh, changed a few things when he reproduced Wilkinson's book in this book but probably the most deceitful act that he performed was to, and I don't know if you can get that camera in here close enough to see this, but here on this piece of paper, we have a reproduction on this side of our authorized Bible vindicated, page 40, by Benjamin G. Wilkinson. And over here we have... Uh, page 215 from which Bible, which is supposedly reproducing the same content on this page. You will note that we have a paragraph there squared off. Now in this quote, Fuller reproduced the footnotes that Benjamin Wilkinson gave in his book, but he omitted a very important footnote when he reproduced Wilkinson's book at the bottom of page 215. The paragraph, which starts up here, which came from Wilkinson over here, is footnoted as coming from the Great Controversy by Ellen G. White. So it's very clear that by removing that reference to Ellen G. White, David Otis Fuller concealed the identity of a Seventh-day Adventist author because he knew full well that fundamental Baptists would not follow the lead of a cultist and he knew that if he mentioned that, you see, people would be turned off to read his book. And we so, all know who Ellen G. White and was. And we all know who Ellen, and Fuller knew you knew who Ellen G. White <laughs> was. Now, this book was the first book to bring out many misconceptions that are repeated by King James only people right down to this day, such as saying that the old Latin versions were the preserved Word of God during the Dark Ages and used by the Waldensians and so forth. By the way, Wilkinson says in his other book that the Waldensians were uh, Seventh-day Adventists. But at any rate, um, Fuller very cleverly dis uh, disguised this man, uh, moved uh, this Trojan horse into fundamentalism, and... Uh, now, what about, publications. what about your second book? Well, uh, I'm going to get to that in just right. a second, but Craigle Publications... Bob, I wrote to Bob Craigle at Craigle Publications and it's very evident in his response to me that for 20 years they had been publishing this book and did not know that Fuller used an Adventist, did not know they were publishing the work of an Adventist. What Fuller did was conceal his identity and gave them an edited manuscript. They did not, Fuller did not give them Wilkinson's book to publish. Now a very popular book, and I need to bring this out right at this juncture. God only wrote one Bible. Now, if we've got anybody watching this program today that is King James only, they've heard of this book before. It's uh, published by uh, Eye Opener Publishers out of Junction City or Eugene, Oregon, by a man uh, by the name of, of Jasper or James Jasper Ray, J.J. Ray. Now, I started reading this uh, just recently over again. I had this book when I was a Ruckmanite myself years ago, but I bought another copy recently from Peter Ruckman's bookstore. And I was reading through this thing and I was looking at the footnotes and I said, you know, I have seen these footnotes before somewhere. And uh, I said, well, I wonder where I've seen them. Well, I even recognized the font size of the lettering. And what I discovered, very surprisingly, was that J.J. Ray, in 1955, and that's when this book came out, stole Benjamin Wilkinson's research. He stole Wilkinson's footnote, I mean chapter, page number, publication and all. Most all of the footnotes in this book are directly transcribed and plagiarized from Authorized Bible Vindicated by Benjamin G. Wilkinson, proving that J.J. Ray did not do his own research. He played a pseudo-scholar 
And he even, and I need to show you a few examples of this while we're on it, he even plagiarized statements directly from Wilkinson's book. This is a purely Wilkinsonian work. And um, some of these I'd like to show here on the screen if we're able to do so. Here is a side-by-side -side page comparison of Wilkinson and Fuller, or Wilkinson and, and Ray, rather. You could say Fuller, too, because Fuller reproduced the same work. Uh, you can see here where there are plagiarisms made. Over here we've got God Only Wrote One Bible, page, nine, uh, page 18. And over here I've got page 16 of our authorized Bible vindicated. There for your camera to see in plain view. And down at the bottom, here are the footnotes of J.J. Ray, two of them on this page, taken directly from a footnote that Wilkinson had on this page referring to Encyclopedia Station. And he says this, now this is J.J. Ray, page 18. He says, Tatian wrote a harmony of the four Gospels which was called the Diatessaron. This was so notoriously corrupt that a bishop of Syria was compelled to throw out of his churches 200 copies because his church members were taking it for the true Gospel. Now here's page 16 of Benjamin Wilkinson. Quote, this same Tatian wrote a harmony of the Gospels, which was called the Diatessaron, meaning four and one. The Gospels were so notoriously corrupted by his hand that in later years the Bishop of Syria, because of his errors, was obliged to throw out of his churches no less than 200 copies, since church members were mistaking it for the true Gospel. You see, the two statements are exactly the same. And he goes right on through... Um, page after page of plagiarism. I, I just went through a random sampling of these, but there are many more. Um, here we find on page uh, 18, the two statements that were at the top of page 18 were transposed, was a transposing of two statements on page 15 of authorized Bible vindicated by Benjamin G. Wilkinson. And then he thought he would go ahead and take a few footnotes, steal a few footnotes off Wilkinson on that page. So he took uh, Eusebius's Ecclesiastical History, Book 5, Chapter 28. And over here we've got Ray saying Eusebius's Ecclesiastical History, Book 5, Chapter 28. Uh, the same with page 21. Two footnotes taken from there. There are, by the way, eight footnotes on page 19, and seven out of eight of them were taken directly from authorized Bible vindicated by Benjamin G. Wilkinson. Now there's one very important thing about Wilkinson's work which we need to mention at this juncture, and that is the fact that he was the first one to apply Psalms 12, 6, and 7 to the King James Version or the Texas Receptus. Turn there in your Bible with us for just a moment to Psalms 12, 6, and 7. And this verse is, is um, used by King James only people and Ruckmanite people to refer to the preservation of the King James Version. I'd like for you to read that for us, Pastor, if you don't mind. Psalm 12, 6, and 7. Please. Well, and, and fortunately, I do have it in the King James Version. So All here right. it is. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. All right. Now, Benjamin G. Wilkinson used this verse to apply to the King James Version. He was the first one ever in history to do so. Make that refer to the preservation of a translation. And on pages 252 and 253, Wilkinson said this, The psalmist wrote, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. The created worlds magnify the exalted name of the eternal. But God has magnified his word above all these. Uh, then he goes on to say, A man is no better in his word. If one fails to co command confidence, so does the other. On page 253, continuing, he says, The words of the Lord are pure words, says the psalmist. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them, every one of them, from this generation forever. Now I'd like for you to, for you to listen to J.J. Uh, Ray on page 93, because he says the same thing Wilkinson just said. 
he condenses what he said and he says God has magnified his word above all his name right here on Wilkinson page 252 thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name Ray says the created worlds magnify the exalted name of Christ Wilkinson the created worlds magnify the exalted name of the eternal Ray a man is no better than his word Wilkinson a man is no better than his word Ray if God's word could be broken, his name would be worthless. Wilkinson, if one fails to command confidence, so does the other. Ray, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, and preserve them from this generation forever. And Wilkinson quotes the very, uh, in the very next paragraph that verse. So Ray is the one that took the idea from Wilkinson that Psalms 12, 6, and 7 refer to the preservation of the King James Version, but even if it did refer to the preservation of Scripture, it would not be referring to the preservation of the King James Version because it's preserved, whatever is preserved there, is preserved from David's generation forever. Precisely. Okay, so it has to be referring to the, the Scriptures David had. The King James Version is only preserved from 1611 on. It's not preserved from, from the days of, of David or the prophets. So this misapplication, and by the way, if you let me see your Bible there for a moment, in verse 5, they always leave out verse 5. Verse 5 says, the, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Actually, the preservation here is of people. If you leave out verse 5, it seems like it's referring to the preservation of the words in verse 6. But you see, in Hebrew, pronouns must match their antecedent in gender and number. And the them of verse 7, the pronoun there, is a masculine pronoun. And the words in verse 6 are feminine gender. So by Hebrew, grammatically, it cannot be referring to the preservation of the words, the feminine. In verse 6, it must be referring to the poor and needy, which are masculine gender, in verse 5. The context bears that out. What is the psalmist saying here? He's saying simply that the Lord's words are faithful. He will keep them. He will uh, uh, do as he has promised to do in preserving his saints, in preserving the poor and needy. In every place in the Psalms, you read about uh, the Lord preserving something, it's the preservation of people that are in view, not the words. Now, I believe in the preservation of the Word of God, but not based on that verse. This movement has taken, by a twisting of this passage of Scripture, made it refer to the preservation of Scripture, which it does not, and secondly, made it refer to the preservation of the King James Version, which it certainly does not. Benjamin Wilkinson is a Seventh-day a seventh Adventist was the first one to concoct that theory. Gary, uh, tie these three books now together with what's called Ruckmanism. Well, Ruckman also repeats the Psalms 12, 6, and 7 argument from Benjamin Wilkinson. In his landmark book, which came out the same year Fuller's did in 1970, so the Christian's Handbook of Manuscript Evidence. The Christian's Handbook of Manuscript Evidence. Uh, this book purports to be a book written in layman's terms who wished to study the issue of which Greek text from which to translate the New Testament. That's going to be the subject of our next program, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the various uh, uh, textual schools and uh, which texts are the most accurate and so on. But tell us something about Peter Ruckman and what he's doing and uh, the whole Ruckmanism movement. Well, it's important to uh, understand that with this book that he wrote, Manuscript Evidence, Ruckman started by saying that his argument was for the Texas Receptus from the standpoint of textual criticism. But by the time you get to the end of the book, the last statement in the book before the footnotes page Said, this is the last statement in the book. Moral, where any version or text contradicts the AV 1611, that's the King James, throw it out. Now, he's already said in earlier pages, and we'll go into this more in the next hour, 
that the King James Bible contains advanced revelation over the Texas Receptus. So the whole idea of defending the Texas Receptus uh, caves in, it self-destructs in Ruckman's argument because his hidden agenda is to make the King James translation an absolutely infallible inspired translation containing advanced revelations over the Greek text, the very Textus Receptus from which it was translated. So this is Ruckman's extreme. So Ruckmanism represents what you might call the most extreme element in the uh, King James only controversy. But the tenets of the teaching were there before he developed And let's that. get it straight. The, uh, the, the Ruckmanism is saying there was not a Bible before 1611. Oh, absolutely not. There was not a preserved, revealed Word of God inerrant in every syllable before 1611, nor has there been since. No, I think, see, this is, this is where people misunderstand Ruckman. Ruckman does believe that there were other Bibles before 1611. He does believe that the absolutely inerrant versions existed before 1611. He has a whole list of them here. I have a, a chart of them here. But if the 1611 uh, corrects all the others. Right. He believes that progressively. It's a progressive revelation. Progressive revelation. Oh, exactly. yes, I see. You see, at one time, uh, Gary was showing me a letter. At one time, Ruckman uh, held the position that uh, the passage in Timothy referred to the original manuscripts. Every scripture is... But uh, now he yeah. holds that inspiration applies to the King James translation. Exactly. Ruckman's got a list here in the Christian's Handbook of Biblical Scholarship of six Bibles, which he claims were the absolutely inerrant versions before the King James. One was the original text in Hebrew, another the original in Greek, the New Testament, but then the old Latin versions, and then Martin Luther's German Bible. But all of these, you see, contradict each other. So according to his erroneous theory, the Word of God is always in flux. But going to what you just said, in a letter that Ruckman wrote, which I'm sure he did not intend to get out, to Dr. R. L. Sumner, the biblical evangelist, in 1971. Here's, I want the camera to zero in on this one for, for evidence of this. Here's the letter. Here's Peter Ruckman's signature right at the bottom, if you can get a view of this, banged out on one of his old uh, uh, key uh, punch uh, typewriters. He said on the second page of this piece of correspondence this, now at no time have I flatly stated that the AV 1611 was the verbally inspired word of God. Verbal inspiration has to do with 2 Timothy 3.16 and deals with the original autographs, as we all know." End of quote. Very clear. 2 Timothy 3.16 deals with the original what autographs. Year, what year was that? 1971. But three years later, in his Acts commentary in 1974, he said this in the preface on page 12. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. There wasn't a word said in 2 Timothy 3.16 about verbally inspired originals. The word was scripture, unquote. So here he says there wasn't a word said about verbally inspired originals. In the letter to Dr. Sumner, Peter Ruckman said in 1971 that 2 Timothy 3.16 dealt with the verbal inspiration of the original text. Now, who are we to believe, the Peter Ruckman of 1971 or the Peter Ruckman of 1974? Now, there's a reason why, and we'll get into this in the next hour, there is a, a very definite reason why he made this change, and I'm going to show in the next hour the influence that led Ruckman to change his view of inspiration in relation to the King James. Let's do one thing here in the minute that we have left, Gary. Obviously, we have another program to follow, part two of this, where we talk about the Greek texts and uh, how uh, um, the King James-only people react to the various Greek texts. We're going to be talking about uh, which translations are more faithful and less faithful and so on. I imagine, though, that our listeners would like some sort of bottom line statement in the last half minute. Um, Obviously, you still use the King James Version of the Bible. Do you also recommend any modern translations as being generally accurate and trustworthy? 
I'm a great believer in the formal uh, equivalence method of translating, and I therefore believe that the formal equivalence translations, such as the King James and the New King James Version, and the New American Standard Version, are accurate, faithful, reliable translations. Some are more accurate than others. There's degrees of accuracy, but it ha doesn't have anything to do with which one is the Word of God. The whole question is degree of accuracy in relation to the text from which they were translated. I do recommend these as, as uh, viable translations for us to use. Spring Fellowship in Austin, Texas has brought you this program and will be bringing you part two of the King James Only controversy next time. Spring Fellowship is a Reformed and Baptist church in the city of Austin, Texas. And thank you for joining us for this program today. Spring Evangelism Presents is brought to you by the Evangelism Committee of Spring Fellowship. We hope you've enjoyed this program and we hope you'll join us for part two of the King James Only Controversy. Till then, God bless you. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are, Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear From You, Jesus Is, and Others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, -S -E -S -S, in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at aol.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours. To the